Yeah. Okay. Well, greetings and salutations, right. test takers. This is the Sherry Seven Guru coming from my studio, not in fabulous uh, Las Vegas, but off grid, undisclosed location in Northern Arizona with uh, Daniel. Daniel won our coaching call every week. At the end of our live stream Q&A, we have a coaching call that we uh, do a drawing for. Uh, Daniel is the winner, and he wants to go over some Kaplan QBank questions. Perfect, because backstage, I can bring up Kaplan questions. Uh, you know, I, I'm allowed to show you Kaplan content. And if you want to buy a Kaplan QBank as a paid supplement with my 15% discount code at checkout, that costs you $55.80. And for that commercial... Uh, we get to look at Kaplan content like this. Okay, Daniel, so this is your first one, 1547745. In the event that a FINRA member firm is found to have violated the conduct rules, I would tell you that's very testable. The code of conduct, that alone could be a test question. Which of the following establishes the ethical behavior that broker dealers and customers, or broker dealers and uh, agents, associated persons, owe customers? A, code of arbitration, and eh. B, Uniform Practice Code, eh. right? Code of Conduct, okay. ding, 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 ding. Code of Arbitration, and eh. So that answer is that's definitely it. Which of the could not be imposed by FINRA? So I like this. Uh, I like this question. This one, Daniel, I think is kind of interesting. Uh, FINRA can certainly find participants, but they can't order us as a self-regulatory organization, and that's the key. They don't have a badge and a gun. So we okay. can say, Daniel, for your uh, bad conduct, you're going to find pay. We're going to fine you twenty five thousand dollars, and that they certainly can do. And if you don't pay, they boot you out of the club, right? Yeah. They can't say, Daniel, you need to write a check to Mister Jones for X number of dollars. That would be done through arbitration or through court. Is there one you liked here before? Let's look at the other ones. They certainly can fine you. They certainly can suspend you, and they can certainly censure you. Uh, I think they don't have a badge and gun. Can't throw you in jail, right? Uh, okay. They deem Fenris on line one. The SEC is on line two. I'm picking up, uh, you know, the SEC line because that is not an SRO. So, you know, Fenra, you know, the SEC is the government. That's not an SRO. Right? So, yeah. Uh, is, uh, yeah. Do you want any further clarification on this? Is there one that you didn't? You were no, that makes sense. I just wanted to make more clarity on that. That, yeah. that makes perfect sense. Um, the next actually. one. The next one I have um, was QID 1557886. Okay. Uh, CG Inc. is proposing an additional public offering. It conducts a rice offering, so very testable. The existing owners of GC Inc. have a preemptive right. They have a right to maintain their proportionate ownership. So before we go sell the new stock, we have to offer it to our existing owners. The mechanism for this is called a rights offering. So it says it conducts a rights offering to current shareholders. So I call you up at your broker. I say, hey, Daniel, uh, you know that G, uh, GC Inc. that you own? You go, yeah. And I said, well, they're uh, offering, doing a rights offering to current shareholders at $55 a share. You should definitely know that rights are exercisable below the current market price. And you definitely should know the rights are short term. Uh, it says plus five rights. So it takes five rights to get an additional share. And so that's what that means by plus five rights. The market price is seven, uh, 70. So in theory, not in practice, in theory, being able to buy the stock at 55 when the stock is at 70, is worth $15 because in the real world, Daniel, something's only worth what someone else is willing to pay. But in right. theory, being able to buy it at uh, 55 is 15. It takes five rights to get one share. And X rights means you don't have to own the stock to participate in the rights offering. So we can actually, if we don't want to participate, I say, Daniel, uh, if you want to participate here, we're going to send your rights and a check for $55 a share into the rights transfer agent, and you will have maintained your proportion ownership. You say, Dean, do I have to participate? I say, no, you do not. If you want, instead of exercising, you could trade this if, uh, to someone else for more than or less than. Now, if it di didn't say X, that means you couldn't trade it because you, you have to own the stock to participate. That's called cum, okay. and that's Latin for with, 
right? And so I don't know if you struggle with this. If uh, My guess is instead of doing the X rights version of this, you added one and did the Coom rights of this. So that would be 15 divided by four. If it was yeah, I got confused. Um, I got to the 15. I just ended up dividing because I didn't know what to do. Yeah, well, that's so a good just... thing to do. I always <laughs> had to decide what to do. Divide, right? so... Yeah, then I got the 15. And then uh, from there, I got stuck. I have it on debrief. I think it's low probability that you're going to have to okay. do this, Daniel. But uh, you definitely need to be able to contrast rights with warrants. Okay. It's a long-term exercisable uh, above is contrasted with rights. And so that's uh, very testable. What is our next one? Okay. Next one is QID 1558196. A uh, municipality's total debt. I call a lot of these legacy questions just to set. Oh, okay. Come on in, Bob. I'm just uh in the middle of a coaching call here. You need need me for anything? No. Okay. Yeah, uh about 30, 40 minutes. I'll be done. Okay, because we're all done. Oh, okay. Well, we can you can do it next time. No worries. I'm building an off grid, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. Epic proportions, <laughs> Daniel. <you know? laughs> no worries. No worries. Every time I think it's done, you know, always something you hear, else. <laughs> you hear in the background. No, I don't hear anything in the background. Oh, great! Because that was what the, my lab. I buried my lithium solar battery behind me, so because it was. Oh wow! Well, no, it's great. I don't hear anything at all. Oh, good. That's fantastic. You're you're helping me field test my off grid location. But what's funny is, uh, my contractor guy said, "Hey, Dean, I've always wanted to build like a secret James Bond kind of a door." And it gives <laughs> build this thing, and I said, and he goes, "You know, people sometimes don't let me build what I want to build." And I said, okay, I felt bad, and I said, okay. <laughs> "And now this secret door is a mess." And I said, "I said, listen, my friend, I." I got to tell you, I just let's go back to the driveway. Just put a regular door on my closet. Just Wait, put a regular door. <laughs> the secret door. I think that's a kind of cool for everybody. Everyone has that idea. Like that's kind of cool to have a secret door somewhere. Yeah, that's in theory. What we're supposed to have is like push it and then it pops out and you can't tell. It's <laughs> oh, I see. That would be cool. That would be yeah, cool. Would but be, a normal door does do it. I don't know what I'm into that closet for, but it's you know thousand dollars <laughs> later. I'm like, okay, let's just go with the basic closet. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. that too. So that's all that. Don't get me going on a rant here, but I call these legacy questions. And what I mean by that, whether it's Kaplan or Past Perfect or STC, uh, they used to go in a lot more nitty gritty about munis. Don't get me wrong, munis are still a huge component of your test, 20 plus questions. I doubt you'll see the net debt total, uh, net total debt there. The answer is A, total debt minus self-supporting debt minus sinking fund accumulations plus overlapping debt. The only part of this that I would worry about is your coach is to make sure you understand that overlapping debt. That's when two or more taxing agencies share some of the same geographic boundaries and are able to issue okay. debt separately. So other than that, I wouldn't worry about this at all. What was your uh, a question or challenge on this one? Um, yeah, just mainly should I memorize that Oh, the, the answer is waste of your brain, brain space. Totally. Okay. Space. Okay. All right. All righty. Next one. Uh, let's see here. Question ID 1547534. Okay. The Alliance Investment Company sent numerous communications to John Smith a lawyer representing the billionaire founder of SpaceX. Oh, it sounds like Elon. Oh, I get it. It's a joke. So instead of SpaceX, it's SpiceX. <laughs> of Elon Musk. It's Elaine Muscolici or whatever. To induce yeah. money to invest with the investment firm. The Alliance Investment Company is required to um, treat the communications institutional because John represents Elaine. Um yeah, there's an intermediary here is what this is about. I, again, I don't think this reflects anything you have to deal with. Uh, on, okay. On the is there one you like better? Were you saying retail communication here? Yeah, I ended up putting treat the community, or no, I put uh, treat the material as correspondence because it's only being directed to one person. Yeah, okay, well, yeah, let's go over the definitions. I won't be in the gray area like this one. You definitely need to know that institutional communication is not a big deal because institutional investors are capable of capable of protecting their own interests, their own assets. Okay. And if it's institutional, but retail is going to get it, then we treat it as retail. And then you need to know retail communication, very testable. 
is more than 25 you know yeah. natural persons living breathing human beings walking planet earth more than 25 prospects or clients 30-day calendar period and the follow-up test question it needs pre-distribution uh, approval by a principal pre-distribution approval and then correspondence is 25 or less and again to that 30-day period and that can be approved by a principal pre or post distribution in other words as a principal of series 24 I can decide to uh, uh, approve that pre or post. Right? Okay, so if regardless of what position they held, if they work for like this example, uh, institutional, it's going to be institutional communication. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's okay. I, that's I, where I, I the bigger takeaway is just knowing that definition of retail. Yeah, communication. and then okay, knowing the correspondence, and then knowing pre or post uh, distribution approval. Right, that's going to be the test question. Okay, got it. All right. Okay. Next one. We have one five four four zero eight zero. Your manager notifies you that a new municipal revenue bond you have been working on has been oversubscribed. <laughs> How is the order uh, priority for this issue determined? Uh, you know, we are going to have an agreement amongst us as underwriters how we're going to do this. Uh, years ago, they used to te te test us on how this would go. And everybody had these memory aids, pro golfers don't miss, pretty girls date more, you know, pretty mm. in Mercedes, pretty girls drive Mercedes. And that would be pre-sale orders would get filled first. Uh, pre-sale would be people who gave us the order before we were awarded the syndicate. Uh, that would be group orders. That would be a client who says, Dean, share this with the rest of the syndicate. It's a group order, also known as an undesignated order. And then we would have a, a designated orders, Dean designate UBS, for example, for credit, and member orders would come last. It was, uh, hasn't been tested like it used to be in a long, long time. The question here is if I depart from whatever it is, I'd have to be able to justify that to the syndicate. And so in that agreement that we have amongst ourselves, you know, the syndicate letter agreement amongst the other writers, we would decide, you know, what was in the best interest of the syndicate. So given this answer set, it's not going to be on a first come, first served. It's outlined the denture. You should be able to toss that out. I yeah. put that one, actually. Well, the I think I got confused when the, I know the trust indentures. The trust uh, indentures uh, has nothing to do with underwritings. The trust indenture, very testable, is a set of covenants or promises between the issuer and the trustee for the benefit of the bondholders. And the main thing we find in there, we get tested on a lot of things found in there, but the main thing is the flow of funds. Yeah. We get tested on there is the net revenue pledge where the operation okay. payment funds has priority. It has nothing to do with underwriting. The, the I think I get confused with the underwriting on municipal. Oh, there's a lot of stuff. They torment you on documents. Yeah. Sure, right? So, I mean, that's... Yeah. yeah. And then you should okay. have the legal opinion has nothing to do with this. The legal opinion, very testable, bond is counsel. by a bond counsel. And you should know that qualified versus unqualified, unqualified is good without reservation. Yeah. You should know that the bond counsel is going to opine about legislative authority to the issue, the bonds, uh, that they're federally tax exempt, and they're exempt from the Prospectus Act. We don't have prospectuses when selling mini bonds. We have official statements. So the answer here is A, I don't think, uh, again, I know as, as your coach, I don't feel too bad about this question. I don't think okay. get this. Let's see what uh, Kaplan tells us of the rationale. The priority of filling municipal orders is established by the managing underwriter in the release terms lender sent to the syndicate once the bid is won. Letter is amendment. So I would think people uh, would be thinking the old pre-sale uh, group designated member, but that wouldn't even apply here because it's oversubscribed, which means we've already won the syndicate in that pre-sale uh, thing would be before we did it. All right. What's our next one? Got it. All right. Uh, one five four six five nine nine. Uh, which of the following balance sheet entries would be affected when a company pays a dividend? Pays a dividend. So that's key. So shareholders equity. No, because it doesn't affect uh, shareholders equity because shareholders equity assets minus liabilities equals net worth. That's shareholder equity, that net worth. 
And we're coming from the income statement when we pay the dividend, it's gonna come out of our current uh, liabilities are gonna go down and our current assets are gonna go down by the like amount. And so it doesn't affect oh, your worth, right? So it comes out of the assets and liabilities, yeah, not the wash. So it's still gonna be less assets minus less liabilities is gonna be the same uh, you know, net worth. Uh, let's see, does it affect, uh, which of the following are affected? Uh, does it affect when a company pays a dividend? Does it affect uh, total assets? Well, it does because remember, I have less assets now because I just paid I the dividend, right? So I have less cash on the asset side of my balance sheet. So that's true. Uh, does it affect liabilities? It certainly does right? because it was a liability when it was declared and now I paid it. And so my liabilities go down. So my total assets go down. My total liabilities go down by the like amount, and it's going to be current assets go down, current liabilities go down. Now, be careful. I think I'll come I ask you what happened when they declared a dividend. Yeah. A different question. If I ask you what happened when they declared a dividend, the working capital would have gone down because a declared dividend becomes a current liability. Okay, that's where I got confused. Yeah, so be careful. Yes. They said declared a dividend. That's not what they said. If they said declared Cash the working dividend. capital would decrease, here it's the payable date, not the declaration date. So on the declaration date, working capital decreases. On the payable date, no effect. Okay, that makes more sense. What's our next one? All right, uh, next one. Um, do one five five nine two three three. Okay. Which of the following would benefit most from portfolio diversification? Uh, I kind of like this is that, you know, the three styles of questions you get, Daniel, on your exam are recognition, you know, T plus one, for example, practical application, like what's the current yield, uh, and judgment questions. This is kind of a judgment question. So these are the kind of questions, about 10% of the exam where you can't really make up a flashcard. You kind of got to reason your way through it. So one yeah. thing I would think about is portfolio diversification is a way to mitigate risk. And some risks can be mitigated through diversification. Some cannot. Now, what we, the way we say that in the test language is risk prevails despite diversification. Risk prevails despite diversification. So now we're going to go through this and we're going to say, okay, well, where would diversification be a risk mitigation strategy? Well, if I have a you know, bond portfolio, it's unlikely that all the bonds in my portfolio are gonna default. And so certainly by buying different issuers, I would lower my rate of a default risk. So the easiest oh. way to diversify would be in the context of a mutual fund. So I say, Daniel, let's not just lend all of our money to one issuer. Let's send some of our money to, you know, uh, XYZ and BFD. Now, again, uh, market risk does, uh, prevails despite your diversification. That's also Correct. known as systematic risk or systemic risk, the tendency of securities prices to move together. I think of this when bad things happen to good stocks. The market risk still prevails. I don't care what bond or preferred stock you have. If... If you have a fixed income investment vehicle, primarily bonds for preferred stocks are also fixed income investment for the vehicles. You don't need to tell me which one you own, Daniel. If interest rates go up, that's going down. That risk is not mitigated through diversification. Purchasing power risk. Okay. Inflationary that risk. That's a risk you're going to have. Now you could you could probably, if I was going to miss this one, uh, you know, by the way, people don't like to hear this, but we can mark you wrong for answers that are correct, even if they're not uh, not wrong, because we say what best, right, or most. Yeah, I put D here. That's how I got it wrong. Yeah, there you go, D. I think D is the best miss. This is your coach, right? I think that's the one that I would. Yeah. Find. I could do tips there. I could do some common stocks there. So yeah, I that's what I was thinking. That's why I was confused why it's default, yeah, but that makes yeah, sense. I just think that A is the better answer, uh, but you're on the right track. So you know, I always joke with people, and you know, sometimes it makes them feel good. I'm not worried when somebody has a, a good miss. And if you watch me do, like I do shared practice tests with somebody and sometimes I yeah. say, that was a bad miss. <laughs> <You know? There's laughs> yeah, sometimes, yeah. We haven't had a bad miss yet, so that's good news. What's our next one? All right, um, one, five, nine, 
4088. Uh, which of the following would be deemed good delivery? So the way I think of this is the Uniform Practice Code standardizes trading practices within the securities industry. This has nothing to do with the customer. Uh, you might go your whole career without seeing a stock certificate, but I assure you that they exist. And, you know, here, if I'm the selling broker dealer, if I don't have proper delivery, that's not getting a pizza in 30 minutes or less. If I don't have proper delivery, the buying broker dealer is going to refuse to settle for a valid reason. The idea here is we don't want to get buried in paper. Somebody's going to go to the transfer agent and get one certificate for 510. And we're talking about who's going to do it. Is it going to be doing by being done by the selling broker dealer or the buying broker dealer? It has nothing to do with the customer. Customer gives me a dog ear mutilated certificate. I say, thank you very much. If this customer gives me uh, two certificates for 205 or what, 255 a piece, I say, thank you very much. But in the back office, the sport, you know, we know we got to get it fixed. I think of it makeable and breakable. Makeable and breakable is the way I think of this. Perfect delivery would be giving you one certificate for 510. That's why the answer is A. B, now this is where people get hung up. If it's 510, we have to have the odd lot in its own pile, if you will. We need to be able to piles of 100. And then I got to take care of that 10 separately. So if I look at choice B here, I go stock trading at 40. It has nothing to do with answering this question. Uh, per share, three certificates, 100. That's fine. But what's not fine is I can't make a pile of 100 for the three for 50s and the one for 60. So that doesn't work. I need to be able to make piles of 100 with the odd lot being its own pile. Right? So I say 100, you're buying broker dealer, I'm selling broker dealer. Daniel, here you go, 100, 200, 300, and then I'm stuck, okay. then I'm stuck. Uh, I could uh, partial delivery, if the amount remaining is an odd lot, no partial delivery would have to be acceptable to the buyer. And you, know, you would say yes or no to that as a buying broker dealer. Uh, bonds and denomination, uh, of 200,000. No, that's not the proper denomination. Let me give you an example of, uh, I gave you one of bad delivery, two certificates of 255. Let me give you another one that would be correct in this 510. How about uh, two certificates of 250, one of 10? No. 250 and 250 is makeable, but it's not breakable. It's not How about uh, 10 certificates of 50 and two certificates of five? 50, 100, 50, 200. 5,300. That would be good. There you go. Piles that of would be good. Five okay, days. that makes so much sense. There you go. So that's how we do that. All okay. right, what's our next one? Great. Next one, we have 1547482. Actually, I've seen a Disney certificate. They're pretty cool. They're very cool. You could actually buy yeah. them. You know, they don't, yeah. you know, a lot of, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's a physical evidence of your ownership. And, uh, you know, nowadays, most people don't really keep them in a safe deposit box or, you know, they have a book entry or they have it. Yeah. yeah. Ampold is facing competition in the EV transportation sector is a large automobile company. It looks like uh, my friend Bill James is in charge of the Capital Key Bank and looks like he's he has a lot of these plays on, on you know, yeah. uh, Tesla. I tried to probably greatly dilute the market share of Ampold uh, common stock. Ampol, well, let's hope not. Dude, Tesla filed for bankruptcy. As a result, okay, so, you know, capitalism without failure is kind of like religion without hell. So, uh, the company's collateral trust certificates would have a higher claim on residual assets. You should definitely know that secured debt and bankruptcy is senior. It has a higher claim on the residual assets at the liquidation. Absolutely. You should know secured is the most senior and common is the most junior. Uh, you should definitely know per B is not true. Preferred stock you should have known is junior to the uh, creditors, the bondholders. So B is not true. The company's mezzanine financing, that's just nonsensical. Mezzanine finance, yeah. finance between the equity and the you know debt. Common shares would be guaranteed. Uh, okay, I finally get to say, Daniel, this is a yeah. this yeah, this is a bad, bad miss. miss. So I got we, hung up on the uh the collateral trust certificates. I forgot that that's a secured debt. In, yeah, that's marketable the... securities placed in escrow. Okay, so don't miss that one again. What's our next <laughs> yeah, one? Uh next one here. Um, one five six four one four zero. I was curious on how testable uh, this question is. Oh, one five six four one zero. One, 
one five six four one four zero. Sorry. Four one four zero zero. Uh, a sixty-year-old customer wants who wants an investment that can provide for retirement needs while adjusting for changes as aging takes place would probably find the investment most suitable. Yeah, that is testable. Uh, that's an aim and shoot point and click kind of a question if you get it. So if you choose a target date fund, then they adjust the portfolio for you based on your target date. So I would be uh, aware of that. Uh, IRA is out. Long-term bond fund would be out because remember, your asset allocation should change as you get older. Correct. Uh, I was in between A and D. That's where I got hung up on. Asset allocation would be, you know, like a balance of 60% bonds, 40% stocks. And so that doesn't that make sense for an older individual too, though? Well, that, well, again, you got what this is one where you could argue, I guess, but it's not the best answer. An oh, asset allocation fund wouldn't be based on a particular target date. It would be based on whether that fund itself fits your profile. They're not targeting uh, their date. They're saying, here's our asset allocation mix. We're going to have, you know, X percentage in bonds and X percentage in stocks. The target date fund will be doing that automatically, changing that mix as you get towards uh, your date. So, yeah, it's testable. Okay. That's uh, what's good. our next one? Um, next one, we have 1614096. Uh, debt instruments where the final payment at maturity is based on the return of a single stock. A basket of stocks and an equity index is called an exchange linked note. Uh, okay, this will be on the test, but it won't be phrased this way. What they're going to ask on the test is to recognize that exchange traded notes, equity linked notes, keyword notes, are debt instruments. So they're just going to point blank and say, which of the following is a debt instrument? A, ETF, okay. eh, you know, mutual fund. But the idea then the second test question about ELNs, equity linked notes, or ETNs, exchange rate notes, is that then the risk is default. So Daniel, if I'm the financial sponsor of this, a bank, I say, Daniel, let's uh, why don't you lend me a hundred thousand dollars, exchange rate note, and I will pay you return based on the referenced index, the S and P five hundred. So the F and P goes up twenty uh, percent. I owe you one hundred and twenty grand. And again, the risk is I don't make good on paying you back that 120 I promised you. So the two test questions recognize it as a debt instrument is contrasted to an ETF, which is not a debt instrument. That's an equity instrument. And then the second test question is like any other debt instrument. One of the risks you have is default. The risk that whoever it is that you want you, you the money to doesn't pay you back. So uh, I didn't like this particular question but i do think you definitely are going to get tested on etns okay all right um i just took all oh, actually, i have one more uh let's see here 1336633 one, 1336633 i'm sorry one three three six six three three six six three six yeah well that's not coming up is that like a chapter check or something or mid mastery no. one three 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 six 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 three three right. yeah that's what it says here that's odd it, it, that that's question has to do with revenue bonds and the uh, credit worthiness, but um. Okay, well that's not uh, coming up for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah that's uh, what you got any um, more Kaplan questions? You can screen. I didn't. I didn't save any more Kaplan questions. I just took the wrong ones I got from my last practice exam. I like, I like that. That's fine. Okay, I'm gonna end our this part of the session. I'm gonna kill the recording. For those of you who are watching the replay with uh, Daniel, our coaching call winner, you don't have the window coaching call to send me any Kaplan question or any question from any vendor. It's just easier if it's Kaplan. But I do appreciate, like Danny, if they have the QID. Uh, you know, Amato is another one of my favorites where we don't have ghost questions. Ghost questions are where somebody says, Dean, somewhere in the materials, there's a question that goes something like, oh, my God, whether it's Kaplan or SDC or Past Perfect or not, and there's thousands of pages of decks there. Uh, if it's a Kaplan question, just uh, Q, send the QID my way. If it's a past perfect or STC or somebody else, then you'll have to screenshot that for me. Uh, join us Tuesday nights. Uh, we're there 5 p.m. Pacific time. Every Tuesday, we do a live stream Q&A. 
You can submit questions uh, for us to cover in that live stream early at livestream uh, at guruexamprep.com. Remember, inch by inch, your Series 7 is sense, yard by yard, your Series 7 is hard. Then I'll be killed, the recording, and then you and I can talk about whatever else you want to talk about, uh, Daniel. Hold on. All right. All right.